Hey y'all, let's do some more forces. In this video, we're studying forces as it pertains to things which are speeding up, slowing down, or changing direction. In a word, things that are accelerating, and for that, we typically use the word dynamic to describe it. So in this video, we're learning about dynamic forces. But first, a little bit of review. Remember, first of all, that a force is a push or a pull, and the unit that we measure pushes and pulls in is newtons. Secondly, remember that forces are vectors, meaning that direction is important. There's a big difference between pushing something to the right and pushing it to the left. Third thing, when the forces are balanced, the object's motion does not change. Remember, this is referred to as the law of inertia. So if there is a balanced force on an object, then its velocity is constant. And again, we use that word inertia to describe it. Um, this is often referred to as Newton's first law of motion. Fourthly, remember how to calculate the weight of an object. Just multiply m times uh, g. Remember m is the mass and g is the gravitational field, which has a value of 9.8 Newton per kilogram which we typically round up to 10, and it typically points down. We always get pulled down by our weight. And then fifth, remember that we can draw a free body diagram to visualize the forces on an object. And so back in the day, we would have things like this, and we would know that the forces are balanced on it, and so they added up to zero, and then we could, from that, determine that the velocity of this object would be constant. So, what's new today? In this video, we're going to study unbalanced forces. So if the forces on an object are not balanced, or unbalanced would be the fancy word to use, then its velocity is not going to be constant. It's going to accelerate, in other words. More specifically, the object is going to accelerate in the direction of the net force on it. Remember that signal, signal, that symbol right here is the Greek letter sigma and it means sum of. So let's draw a few examples of some free body diagrams of things that are accelerating. So let's suppose we have something that's getting pulled down and has a weight or um, a normal force pushing it up, so it's like on a surface, it then just has a tension force going to the right. This object will accelerate to the right. It's got a net force directed to the right. This object, the way I've drawn that, is going to accelerate to the left. And then this object right here, where the normal force is larger than the weight, it represents something that would accelerate upwards. So that third free body diagram that I drew might represent you in an elevator when you're traveling upwards, when you're accelerating upwards. So right away, something to be careful about. The direction of motion, like the direction an object is moving, and the direction of its acceleration are not always the same. So be real, real careful when you're given the forces on an object and you're asked to describe the motion of it. The acceleration and the motion, the velocity, could be in different directions. So let's suppose for a second we took those same three free body diagrams that I just drew. And let's suppose more specifically we knew what their initial velocities were. So let's suppose the first two have an initial velocity going to the right, and the last one has an initial velocity going down. So if the initial velocity and the net force are in the same direction, it's going to keep moving in that direction and speed up. So that first situation represents something that's going to move to the right and speed up. However, that second situation, they are in opposite directions. It's moving to the right, but the net force is directed to the left, and so that represents something that's going to keep moving to the right, because things in motion naturally want to keep moving, but it's going to slow down due to that force, and eventually it would stop. Not right away, but eventually. And so the last one, 
The net forces upwards, it was moving downwards to begin with, represents something moving down and slowing down. So for example, that last one might be you in an elevator which is going down, but slows down when it gets to the ground floor so that you can you know, get off of it without hurting yourself. So, kind of an important rule to remember, and we know this from the acceleration. When the net force is in the opposite direction of the object's initial velocity, it's going to slow down. So that's an important thing to remember, and it's something that often we get confused about. So I want to make sure we get the right idea right away. Okay, so let's talk about how big an acceleration can be. The size of an acceleration is going to depend on two things. And I bet if you hit pause on this and you thought about it for just a minute, you might be able to come up with what those two things are. So do that for a second. Hit pause, see if you can decide what those two things should be, and then press play again. So the first thing you might have come up with is just how big the force is on it. And so the, the um, first thing that affects the acceleration of an object is how big the net force is. The larger the net force is on an object, then the larger the acceleration is going to be. And if you think about it intuitively, that should kind of make sense. You tap something, it's going to go a slow dist or a small distance. If you run up and kick the heck out of something, it's going to go a much further distance. So the size of the force you put on something is going to be the first factor determining the acceleration. And they're directly proportional. The bigger the force, the bigger the acceleration. The second thing is the mass of the object. Heavier objects are more difficult to accelerate. So if you run up and kick a soccer ball, it's going to go a lot farther than if you run up and kick a bowling ball. The bowling ball's got a lot more mass, so it's much more difficult to accelerate. So a larger mass is going to mean a smaller acceleration. So when one thing get, gets bigger and the other thing gets smaller, then we say that they are inversely related. So we can write that A is inversely proportional to M, or A is proportional to 1 over M. So these two um, things, this big idea in other words, is often referred to as Newton's second law of motion. So we already knew the first law, now we know the second law. To kind of keep it rolling, if we combine those two proportionalities into one, then we can write something that looks like this, where acceleration is proportional to net force over m. Now if we choose, and keyword here is choose, the unit for force such that it is equal to kilogram times meter per second squared, then we can change the proportional sign to an equal sign. And so we're going to do the same uh, ratio there, force over mass, but I'm going to write an equal sign. And then what we have to do is say that our unit for force, which we call the Newton, has to be a kilogram times a meter per second squared. And so we can make that equation A equals force over mass only if we choose the unit for Newton to be exactly this. And so if you were not using kilograms, meters, seconds, and newtons, if you're using the customary English system where the unit for force was pounds, then this equation doesn't work anymore. You have to have like a proportionality constant in there. And so it's much easier to stick with our SI system where we measure forces in newtons. So let's look at a quick example. Suppose we had a free body diagram that looks something like this, where we have a 30 kilogram object, a 900 newton normal force pushing it upwards, and then obviously the force of gravity pulling it down, and we want to know what is the acceleration of this object. So we can use Newton's second law, acceleration equals net force over mass, 
the only thing that we got to do first is figure out what the net force is. So I know what the mass is going to be. I can go ahead and put that in there. So the next thing we need to do is figure out how big the net force is. So I know that the net force would be the up forces minus the downs. I know what the normal force is, but I don't know what the weight is. But remember, we can calculate the weight by doing the mass times the gravitational field. And so that would be like 300 kilograms times 10 newtons per kilogram. Remember, we can round 9.8 off to 10. And so that would give us something like 300 newtons. And so my net force is simply 900 newtons minus 300 newtons, which is 600 newtons. So plugging in my 600 newtons up there in a newton second law, and I would get something like 20, and the unit would be newton per kilogram right now. Now we know acceleration should be meters per second squared, so let's see if that's actually what we get out of this. So the new definition of a newton is a kilogram times meter per second squared. Have to define it that way for newton second law to be um, the way it is and then the mass is still in kilograms. And so we can see that the kilograms cancel out, leaving us with 20 meters per second squared. And then last, remember we need to include a direction with a vector, so since the net force is up, the acceleration must be up. Now we're done. Let's look at another example. Here I've got a five kilogram object, and it's on a level surface, and so those two up and down forces are balanced. We've got a rope pulling it to the right, and then friction, for whatever reason, slowing it down by pulling it to the left. Um, we know these two forces, tension 75 newtons, friction 55 newtons, and the question is the same. Find the acceleration. And so we could, if we wanted to, write a net force equation in both directions, the net force in the y direction equation would look like that, but those forces are still balanced. The net force in the x direction equation will look something like that, tension minus friction. So again, the y forces are balanced, so I can say that the net force in the y direction is zero. What that means is that they don't affect the acceleration. This thing is not going to accelerate up or down, it's only going to accelerate left or right. And so doing the same thing we did earlier, finding the net force, be 75 minus 55, so 20 newtons, and then using Newton's second law, so 20 newtons over 5 kilograms, would give us an acceleration of 4 meters per second squared, and again that's directed to the right. Net force is to the right, acceleration is to the right. Let's look at another example. Suppose we got something that's again tied to a rope, but this time the rope's not exerting as much force as the weight is. And so this is something that's going to accelerate downward. And so, so suppose we know that the acceleration of this 100 kilogram object is 2 meters per second downward. And what we want to figure out is how big is the tension on it. So we can do the same thing where we find the weight first, and so a 100 kilogram object weighs a thousand newtons. By now we should be getting to the point where we can kind of do that in our heads real quick. So if we write a net force equation, it might look something like this. Now you might say, why didn't I do ups minus downs? Why did I do downs minus ups? The reason I did that is because it makes my acceleration positive. So whenever your acceleration is positive, it's just going to keep you from messing up the signs. And so if we made it um, tension minus gravity, then we would have to go back over here and remember to make the acceleration negative. That's a pain, so I recommend you just stick with always keeping the acceleration positive. Now that's useful and all, but there's two things missing in that equation. And so we need a second equation. So we're still going to need to use Newton's second law. If I know what the acceleration is, then I can solve that for the net force. 
Net force equals mass times acceleration. And so the mass is 100, the acceleration is 2, and so the net force on this guy is 200 newtons. And that would be directed downwards since the acceleration is downward. So now that I know what the net force is, I can go ahead and solve this for the tension. Since you're solving for something that's negative, I would recommend you add it to both sides first. That way you don't have to worry about the negative sign anymore and then subtract both sides by the net force and that'll give you the tension. And so my tension will be equal to 1000 newtons of weight minus 200 newtons of uh, the net force and so the tension would have to be 800 newtons and it's still directed upwards. So we have to remember to go back and add in that directional part. Here's a good way to tell if you did this correctly or not. The tension force that you drew over here in your free body diagram is less than the weight. And so your answer here should be less than the weight. And so if you got something bigger than a thousand, then you know you messed up somewhere, and usually where we mess up is something about the signs. We mess up the signs because uh, we forget about the direction sometime. So always compare your answers and see if they are reasonable. So do this. See if you can work this question on your own. We've got a four kilogram object that's being pulled to the right by a string, so similar situation, which exerts 80 newtons of force causing it to accelerate to the right at one meter per second squared. And your job is to figure out how big the force of friction is on this object. So press pause for a little bit. See if you can figure out the force of friction. I recommend a free body diagram first. And then press play to see if you did it correctly. So like I said, I would draw a free body diagram first. My free body diagram will look something like that. And then note your accelerations to the right, meaning friction should be smaller than tension. Next thing you might do is use Newton's second law. Find the net force on the object. And 4 kilograms times 1 meter per second squared gives you a net force of 4 newtons. The next thing you might do is write a net force equation, or maybe you did that first and then realized you needed to do this before you could use that net force equation. And then solving for friction. And so substituting in our numbers, and so we'd get something like friction is 76 newtons, don't forget about the direction. Friction's pulling it to the left. So making sure we got the right direction is just as important as making sure we've got the right number. So here are some always things to do. Always draw a free body diagram. Always write a net force equation. And when something's accelerating, always use Newton's second law. You're going to have to use all three of those tools in order to analyze a situation where the forces are unbalanced. So that's the end of our lesson on forces and dynamics. I leave you with this.